and he's going to talk to us about a paleobotany summary from, from his physiological point of view. John. Thanks, Bill, and thanks to the organizers and the support staff for running this. Um, next slide, please. Uh, before I begin, I just want to uh, organ uh, thank and um, acknowledge all my collaborators that have worked on this project, um, in particular, a uh, number of undergraduate students who've contributed to the work uh, that you're going to see. Uh, next slide, please. Now, we all know, uh, you know, after several days of talking about this, that the Casamovian is a well-documented transition in the Earth system, and we've seen many presentations across the terrestrial and marine realms, and workers in the terrestrial realms have recognized these differences for quite some time, and effectively, one of the questions that we've all been asking is, how do we get from the left image on this slide to the right image? Uh, next slide. Now we know uh, for a, we know over the last decade or so there's been an emerging perspective that this transition is actually quite complex and protracted on land. It's um, punctuated by discrete events, but it's also part of the longer term uh, trend throughout the pen perm. And one notable transition occurs in the lower part of the Casamovian. Uh, next slide, please. Which is shown in this diagram that you know has been shorthanded the collapse of the coal forest, which is the replacement of the arborescent lycopsids in the Illinois basins, uh, the Illinois basin with tree ferns. However, um, on the next slide, please. We've seen uh, five really excellent paleobotanical talks yesterday that have demonstrated multiple lines of, of what seems to be multiple lines of evidence for what seems to be a kind of emerging consensus of complex patterns of ecosystem change changes in biodiversity and abundance, and asynchronous floral change across this period. And taken together, all these patterns suggest environmental control on vegetation and feedbacks that may not be global and instantaneous, and therefore there may be a role for plant biology in the response of these ecosystems to environmental change. Now, if we were in the Cenozoic, or if this event were occurring in the Cenozoic, one way to examine this would be to actually take these plants and bring them to a lab or a growth chamber. However, we're in the Paleozoic. Uh, next slide, please. So therefore, we have a very limited insight from comparative biology and plant physiology. And we know that plant physiology is plastic and it's variable among taxonomic groups. There's lots of functional diversity among groups that are closely related, you know, for example, conifers today. And so in this case, we have to go back to first principles and ask ourselves, how did these late Paleozoic plants work? Next slide, please. Now, just to refresh everybody's memory, um, plants are a key interface between the water and carbon cycles and are biophysical, so their physiology can be inferred from morphology alone. And just to remind you the kind of core of what plants do is that plants exchange water for carbon through their leaves. They open their stomata and their leaves, water evaporates, that pulls a continuous liquid column of water through a network of dead cells called xylem because of hydrogen bonding between water molecules. And effectively, these xylem cells within these stems are like straws with their ends closed and holes in the sides. And there are two common morphotypes today. There's vessels that are found in mostly angiosperms that are multicellular and tracheids that are single-celled. Now, from a biophysical perspective and quantitatively, the flow rate through an empty conduit is proportional to the fourth power of the radius. So a small increase in width of these cells gives a huge return on flow rate to the organism. And all else being equal, more water that can be supplied to the leaves uh, can yield more carbon dioxide and more photosynthesis. And this is a passive process. Plants aren't expending energy to do this, but this comes at a cost. Next slide, please. And the cost is that low, low uh, pressure or water stress can allow air to enter the xylem, which can then expand and block the transport of water. And this is a process called cavitation and embolism. And without water supply to the leaves, uh, uh, the leaves will eventually wilt and the plant will eventually die. And biophysically, plants can maximize for one or the other. They can maximize flow rate but have vulnerable xylem or maximize safety at the cost of flow rate. And if we zoom into the tracheid, uh, next slide please. We can see within these tracheids that the key features of xylem conductivity and safety come from these porous structures called pits on the walls. And these are just two images giving you a sense of what these structures are. They're subcellular structures. Uh, and there are two common kinds in extant seed plants, but there are many kinds in the fossil record. Uh, next slide, please. And the morphology of these structures has a strong effect on the ability of water to pass from one cell to another, as well as the ability to prevent and contain or repair embolism. Now, what's important about all these xylem features, however, is, next slide, that we can actually calculate the hydraulic conductivity of fossil plant wood because we have, a, we have a beautiful record of conduits and pits in the fossil record. Next slide. 
Anywhere we have anatomically preserved xylem cells, they can be modeled, whether that's silicified material or charcoalified material, uh, any organ with xylem for that matter, roots, stems, or leaves. And we measure these parameters that I've listed here on this slide to calculate hydraulic conductivity. So we can measure and quantify the flow rate through the xylem in these different plants. And that's actually not all that we can do from looking at the anatomy. Next slide, please. We can also calculate how vulnerable xylem cells are based on their pit structure. We use the capillarity equation down below to determine uh, how easy it is for air to pass from one cell to another. Uh, next slide, please. And we can measure these properties from SEM images and quantify them statistically in plants. So how does this work actually in practice? Next slide. We use image analysis of fossils and, and take these values by measuring conduits uh, and put them in computational models. And effectively, this is quantitative functional morphology, but for plants. Uh, and I'm gonna build up from here to start talking about uh, from stems to larger scale uh, processes that we understand from these uh, late Paleozoic plants. But before we dive into the data, I think it's helpful to step back and define some terms. Next slide, please. One particular term that's important to think about for plants is a term called water use efficiency. And water use efficiency in plants is, is defined as a ratio. Uh, and it's defined as the ratio of photosynthesis to transpiration in plants. And effectively, a plant with high water use efficiency is, is generally conservative with water. It has either a low transpiration rate, a low, uh, a low transpiration rate, or a very high photosynthetic rate, or usually both. Low water use efficiency plants are profligate with water. They transpire a lot. Next slide, please. Another key term is a term called leaf area index, and this is actually the, the ratio of the total leaf area of a plant uh, to the soil area. So how much of the soil is effectively covered by leaf area above it? And just to remind you, cavitation and embolism, this is air entry and blockage of water transport system, and this can, cause by, this can be caused by excessive drought, frost, or other environmental stress. And it's important to know that it's lethal if this isn't repaired or xylem isn't replaced. Now with the kind of physiology background out of the way, let me introduce you to some of the key plants. Uh, next slide. Uh, these are the key players throughout this time period. Many are familiar to you. There's lots and lots of morphological diversity in the Carboniferous forest that isn't represented here. But let me introduce you to three of these plants because of their unusual structure and what studying them tells us about late Pennsylvanian plant physiology. Next slide. Uh, we've talked a lot this week about the medullosins, and just to refresh everybody's memory, medullosins are a group of morphologically diverse seed plants. They have a large leaf area and small stems, and they have very interesting internal anatomy. Next slide. This is a cross-section of a medullosa stem, uh, and it has a eustiel that has had anomalous development of secondary xylem that yields uh, discrete segments throughout the stem. And in fact, it looks as though it formed through fusion of separate, of separate stems outlined in green, but it's actually anomalous development. And these plants are also interesting on a cellular level as well. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and these uh, medullosins uh, have xylem cells that are among the largest in the fossil record. Here's a light micrograph of a medullosin tracheid with a pine tracheid at the same, at the same uh, scale. And all, all told with medullosins, these large leaf area and large xylem cells, we associate th these features today with plants that have high water demand and that can supply high water demand. Now on the other end of the physiological spectrum, let me show you a different plant. Next slide, please. This is a cross-section of Saronius, uh, our tree fern, what a key plant in the time period that we're talking about. And looking down on this plant uh, from a cobalt material, you can see that most of the cross-sectional area of this plant is actually root mantle. And through some of the work with my students, we've been macerating cobalt material to understand the tissues of these plants a bit better. Uh, next slide, please. And you can see here, uh, this is actually an SEM of tracheids that were macerated from Saronius. And this, the preservation uh, in cobalt material is extraordinary. If we take a closer look, next slide, we can actually see very fine details, parts of the pit membrane that are still attached to the scleriform bars of these tracheids, you know, more than 300 million years later. So this is a very interesting plant as well. And a third important plant in the floral transition is one that I'll talk about next. Uh, next slide, please. And this is Sphenophyllum. And Sphenophyllum is a small, a scrambling, or a climbing sphenopsid with really extraordinary xylem. And many of us are familiar with the Sphenophytes as a highly stereotyped plant group, but there are actually some surprises here. Next slide, please. Within the uh, sphenophytes, we have sphenophyllum here on the bottom left, and arthropity is a fragment of an arthropity stem on the bottom right. We know these plants are closely related, but they're actually physiologically distinct. Uh, and up at the top right, uh, I'm, I've included the extant horsetail equisetum, including uh, equisetum giganteum, the giant horsetail, for comparison. So note the size and morphological differences between these three plants. And if you look within the stem of arthropities on the bottom right, next slide. 
we can actually see well-resolved tracheids and pits from arthropides uh, that have been macerated from the coal balls. And I just want to point out, note the scale bar on these. These tracheids are roughly 50 microns uh, in diameter. So let's start with the sphenopsids and build upward and outward from anatomical measurements to function to whole plants. Next slide, please. Simple anatomical measurements uh, show that even a highly stereotyped lineage like the sphenopsids has cryptic fun functional diversity within it. Um, this is this are, are some measurements that have been made by undergraduate students uh, looking at sphenophyllum, arthropides, and equisetum. And on the left are the we're plotting the trachea diameter, so how wide these conduits are. Uh, and this uh, sphenophyllum in particular, this is 1,700 measurements that were made by an undergraduate student. And what I'd like it to call your attention to is remember the R to the fourth power here. So a small change in the radius gives you a huge inc increase in flow rate. So if we compare a typical equisetium tracheid with a radius of about 7.5 microns and a typical sphenophyllum tracheid with, that has a radius of 100 microns, but its diameters are, exceed 200 microns, the flow rate through a sphenophyllum tracheid would be more than 31,000 times higher. And if we compare arthropides, it would be more than 29 times more conductive than an equisetium tracheid. And effectively, what this is telling us is that sphenophyllum is like a tropical vine. An arborescent calamitalium like arthropides are more like tree ferns than they are like sphenophyllum. And neither one is very much like uh, extant equisetum from a hydraulics perspective. Now, as we build these measurements uh, from anatomical measurements to the computation of flow rate, we can plot these results in an ecospace or a physiological morphospace. Next slide, please. If we look at ecosystems today, we have essentially two end members of the physio of the hydraulic spectrum. We have angiosperms that have multicellular conduits that have very wide tracheids, which we can see on the, on the x-axis here, and high conductivity, which we can see on the y-axis. So what does the Carboniferous period look like? Next slide, please. Well, the Carboniferous is very interesting because but both ends of the hydraulic spectrum are occupied by the late Pennsylvanian period, and specific plants are in particular parts of this ecospace. Next slide, please. For example, we have cordatalians and tree ferns that are on the, the, the uh, low, lower conductive portion of the ecosystem, of the ecospace. Uh, they are more drought resistant than medullosins and sphenophyllums. And I have some unpublished data that's not plotted here showing that arborescent lycopsids are actually somewhere in the middle. They're a bit on the lower part of the high conductivity end of this ecospace. And so in many ways, the Carboniferous looks like the modern distribution. And recall that plants with high conductivity are vulnerable to cavitation and embolism. So replacing a forest of wetland medullosins with coniferophytes and tree ferns is not only going to change their drought vulnerability of the ecosystem, but it's going to change the export of water to the atmosphere. Now to put these results in the evolutionary context, next slide please. I just want to point out that this tells us on a stem level that carboniferous plants really are exceptional. The top right portion of the hydraulic ecospace is mostly vacant until the evolution of angiosperms in the mid-Mesozoic. And in an effort to build up from these results, we've been working to scale this understanding up to learning about whole plants. Next slide, please. Now we know that plants are an integrated system of organs. They're leaf stems and roots, they, they function as an integrated system. However, we can't simply pull these defined modern plant types off the shelf and use them because Carboniferous roots, stems, and leaves are too different. They kind of break our anatomical rules that we know from looking at modern ecosystems. So how do we do this? How do we understand these plants if we can't take them to the lab and their combination of characters uh, is a bit different? Next slide, please. Well, we do this by gathering up individual fossils of plants. And what you can see here, we have cuticle, we have a leaf anatomy of an allothopterus, and then stem anatomy. Next slide, please. And we reduce the plant to a series of equations, uh, which you can see up here is a diffusion equation for stomata, a hydraulic uh, conductivity for leaves, and then stems. Next slide, please. And we can take these equations and the key parameters, we can define them by the fossils themselves. And so we talked about stems, but I'm going to talk briefly about leaves. What happens if we take this top equation of stomatal conductance and apply this to carboniferous plants? Next slide, please. Our leaf modeling shows us that carboniferous plants could transpire a great deal of water using different uh, anatomical strategies. Lycopsids uh, transpire through having many stomata on their leaves. Medullosins, <clears throat> excuse me, transpire a lot through large stomata on their leaves. And they're both comparable to uh, stomatal conductance, uh, transpiration values that we see in uh, modern plants as well. And just to highlight what this means in an anatomical context, next slide, please. Uh, this, is a, this is a cuticle image of Swillingtonia denticulata, uh, which is an interesting lycopsid uh, that shows that uh, this leaf has more than 25% of the cells on the leaf surface area are stomata. And these values that we find from parameterizing leaves and stems provide an interface and critical parameters for a process-based approach to ecosystems and their effects on the planet. So I want to highlight what we learned from testing these plants and how these plants respond to environmental change. Uh, next slide, please. 
This is a plot uh, examining these Paleozoic, Paleozoic plants' water use efficiency and comparing different groups with one another. And on these plots, you can see as CO2 increases, the drought tolerant, tolerant tree ferns like Saronius increases their water use efficiency, but Megalosin, Sphenophyllum, and the arborescent lycopsids can't. And so we would expect that a warming and a, or a, and a higher CO2 world would select for tree ferns uh, over our high transpiration but drought vulnerable lycopsids and Megalosins. And this approach here kind of resembles taking an individual plant and putting it in a growth chamber and stress testing it. You can learn a lot about how these individual plants respond, but we at this meeting would really like to know how plants in biomes respond to this environmental context. Next slide, please. So I've been a part of a collaboration to build these plants into the current generation of earth system models. And it's a substantial effort. It involves looking from roots to leaves to ecosystems, examining features from the scale of microns, uh, from plant anatomy to tectonic plates. And one major challenge for studying the Paleozoic is we can't just use modern uh, definitions. Paleozoic plants have a distinct anatomy and physiology, and it requires a different and more comprehensive approach. Next slide, please. My colleague Joseph White has developed an implementation of the process-based ecosystem model Biome BGC for fossil plants called PaleoBGC. Now, this is a quantitative approach to environmental, environmental uh, parameters based on well-defined equations and processes, uh, the Bulberry equation for photosynthesis, for example. And to give you just an example of the type of modeling that's used under, let me give you just a peek under the hood. Uh, next slide. Uh, when plants open their stomata, they lose water from their leaves and their leaf and stem water potential decreases. And when these values decrease below a certain threshold, the plant closes its stomata. And what we built for PaleoBGC was a process that uses the vein length per area preserved in leaf anatomy to define these parameters. And most importantly, we use the variability of leaf anatomical features that are found in fossils to determine those values at which stomata open and close and the leaf hydraulic conductivity as a whole. And this process replicates what's widely observed in leaf in the labs, uh, you know, if you take an oak leaf and put it on a bench, this is what you would see. Uh, but it's grounded in observations from the fossil plant anatomy themselves. So what can you do with this model? Uh, next slide, please. This is a great diagram from John Ritchie, uh, John Ritchie's paper, uh, showing that you can combine PaleoBGC and geochemical modeling, meteorological parameters, and paleogeography to simulate these ecosystems. And the fossil plant parameters are here in green, they're direct input, and PaleoBGC is part of a larger process to understand how plants respond and drive to the environment. So what does this approach tell us about the Casamovian? Next slide, please. We can model plant behavior. This is a, a plot from the White et al. 20, uh, 2020 paper. And what it's showing is that based on differences in plant anatomy, we see different functional responses to environmental challenges such as drought here. And in this plot, we have soil water availability. And as it decreases, the lycopsids wilt first and tree ferns are the most hydrated. So this tells us about the water response. Next slide, please. We're also interested in the photosynthesis. These are also plots from the White et al. 2020 paper. At the top right, we can see the photosynthetic rates for key carboniferous plants, and we can see that they're capable of substantial photosynthesis. And when these values are low, it's because they're water stressed or their stomata are closed, and they compare quite well to our modern plant functional types. And on the bottom left, we can actually see that when plants are above this horizontal line, they're hydrated and photosynthesizing. When they're below, they're water stressed and not growing. And lycopsids in green and megalosins in red are always more stressed and more vulnerable to drought, and they cross over this line first. Next slide, please. And one more figure from the White et al. Uh, 2020 paper, the most intriguing results have come from a series of experiments or simulations where precipitation was reduced in order to investigate the effects of biomass, which you can see on top, and, and uh, leaf area index, or LAI, on the bottom. And as we move from right to left, our key plant groups have differentially strong responses to precipitation reduction. Uh, the lycopsids and megalosins have high transpiration rates. They lose leaf area and biomass first. <clears throat> whereas the tree ferns uh, and cordatalians retain biomass and LAI. And because the lycopsids and megalosins have high transpiration rates, that means that the ecosystem overall would have lower transpiration and would increase drought. And this would cause a positive feedback to dry the ecosystem further. So reduction in vegetation has profound effects on runoff, energy balance, uh, and albedo and soil formation as well. Next slide, please. Thinking about this effect in the context of the Casamovian gives us a mechanism for understanding these repeated restructuring events. So we have eccentricity scale shifts that are superimposed over this longer aridity trend. And as you pass these thresholds, low water use efficiency and high transpiration floras are replaced by high water use efficiency and low transpiration floras. This amplifies the climatic factors and different basins would across these thresholds at different times spurred by environmental factors. So let me wrap up with some summary notes. Next slide, please. 
Here are just some heuristics for interpreting the physiology of xylem cells wherever you find them in wood leaves or roots. Uh, if you have wide or long tracheids, that's high hydraulic conductance. Low conductance uh, uh, is demonstrated by narrow tracheids. Small differences in size matter. Uh, remember R to the fourth. And like the sphenophytes I showed earlier, there's likely to be a great deal of functional diversity that may be masked by the morphological similarity of many of these carboniferous plants. And if you have permineralized xylem and would like to know more about it, please let me know. Uh, turning to the Casimovian, uh, next slide, please. As I mentioned yesterday, there are several aspects of regional climate that could result in an extirpation of the wet lycophytes, local drought, seasonality, rain shadow from orography, and the fluid earth is playing a major role as is temperature. And the fact that this replacement is occurring asynchronously is instructive. It's telling us that I think that there's a feedback between the abiotic earth and the biosphere. And second, there's this dynamic response of vegetation throughout the Casimovian. We get these expansion of certain physiotypes and then retreat and then repeating as Herman and Sasha pointed out so effectively yesterday. And within these changes, we'd expect functional diversity to be present. You know, marginally more drought resistant lycophytes will be predicted to survive and a closer look at these plants may be instructive. And finally, from an evolutionary perspective, this is a really pivotal time in plant evolutionary history. And to the best of our current resolution, this period is a loss of one particular ecophysiological strategy that isn't revisited on a global scale until the angiosperms arise in the mid Mesozoic. Next slide, please. So let me sum up. Uh, as Bill said this morning, this is a really critical interval in plant history. These floral transitions had major effects on local hydrologic cycles and runoff regimes. And rather than thinking of th this event as a bolide impact, a physiological lens suggests that in environmental change, plant community change, and positive feedbacks have been amplifying these changes. And in this way, of, you know, I'd like to just toss out a hypothesis that the broader Casimovian transition is kind of a reverse of the greening up that we see in the Devonian and the Mississippian, which was also asynchronous and proceeded at slightly different rates around the world. But rather, this is a destabilization of high transpiration ecosystems rather than an expansion of vegetation onto the land. Thanks for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, John. Thanks very much. Um, John has raised a bunch of. Uh, of issues here. We have any questions out there from you plant folks or non-plant folks? This is the sort of the second uh, plant talk with, with various kinds of mathematics in it. John? Um, this is hey, that was, uh, oh, uh, hang on, that was a really great uh, uh, presentation. Thanks so much. And so many things to, to think about. But the one of the threads throughout all of our discussions have been has been an almost cataclysmic change at one point the floral break the collapse of the uh coal forest where does that fit in this model that you've just given us can you give us a a, a bit of a picture have they been have they been pulling us along by the nose on this or or is there some reality in the claim that some people make on this uh, collapse of the uh, forest. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot, John. That's, that's, that's a great point. Um, and so one of the things that we see when we do this type of modeling is um, that uh, there, uh, there's the possibility of catastrophic loss of these plants that could occur extremely rapidly. Uh, as the landscape dries, um, one of the things we know from looking at lycopsid uh, xylem anatomy, for example, is that it is um, uh, extremely vulnerable to embolism spread. So when these plants uh, experience a drought period, we would expect an embolism to spread throughout the xylem of the plant quite quickly. And that is lethal uh, permanent damage for plants. And so something that I think we see from both the individual plant modeling and the ecosystem modeling is that there's the possibility of crossing a threshold where you move the entire biome of all the wet lycophytes, all of a sudden, all of them are in the lethal zone. And you could expect them all to, to be extirpated quite quickly. I mean, you know, we've seen this with um, bark beetle, for example, in the forests of, uh, of Western North America, that you can see um, uh, you can see catastrophic loss of particular types of plants over a very short amount of time. So I do think there are going to be these events where we're going to see where these signal uh, disappearances are real. And it's, it's a combination of you, you cross soil water, potential drops below where it's too dry, they can't rehydrate. Uh, and then they embolize and they're gone. And that's further complicated by the fact that lycophytes need environmental water for their reproductive biology as well. So they're not only getting um, harmed by the reproductive part of their life cycle, but also their vegetative life cycle as well. So I think the, these, these uh, catastrophic uh, uh, 
events are, are real and they're reflecting um, uh, you know, amplification of these sort of, of basin wide events. You get a drought, you replace some wet plants with dry, with dry plants uh, and it amplifies it. Thanks, John and John. Uh, we have two questions. We have one from Cortland and one from Sandra. Cortland. Yeah, uh, John, great talk. Um, hey, the question I have is, uh, you know, <clears throat> when we do see the uh, the loss of the lycopods um, at the Casimovian um, boundary, sigillaria keeps going. And I, the question I've always had is, is, is it a function of it, it is, um, it's it's functioning differently hydrologically, or is it is it major is it is it primarily a function of a different reproductive mor morphology, or is it oh, both? That's, that, that's a question. That's a that's a great question, Cortland. Um, and so I, I can't speak to the reproductive uh, biology um, directly. That's that's not my, that's not my area of expertise. But what I can speak to is the um, the xylem anatomy is distinct between Lepidofloios and Sigillaria, for example. Oh, okay. And what's very interesting, uh, I had an undergraduate student who worked on this for a thesis that was disrupted by the pandemic, um, is that Lepidofloios is closer to Sphenophyllum and Medullosa and having a highly vulnerable xylem. Sigillaria, on the other hand, is still a bit vulnerable, but closer to Saronius and closer to some of these more drought resistant plants. And so we don't have um, statistical evidence yet, but I would, my sort of hypothesis that I'm, that I'm uh, hoping to test further is that I think there's some functional divergence between, the, between these, lyco, these uh, lycopsids. I think Sigillaria is distinct from uh, even other arborescent lycophytes. Okay, thank you. That's very interesting. And Sandra has a question, but I, and maybe after that, Herman, if, if there's still time, could chime in about uh, Stigmaria asiatica, which he and, um, and Wang Jun have published on, which would be interesting. But Sandra's first up, so go ahead, Sandra. Um, yeah, so I always thought of like the basic physiological parameters in a higher clade as being fixed, right? Like you'd never expect a lycophyte to physiologically resemble an angiosperm or vice versa. So I was surprised to see in your talk, I think it was the horsetails that they have evolved quite a bit and they look nothing like what they used to physiologically. So could you speak a little bit more as to why and how that might've happened? Yeah, that's, th thanks Sandra. That's really, that's really interesting. Um, and, and yeah, that is something that, that we see that w this is part of the, part of what makes the late Paleozoic plants so fascinating from a physiological perspective, but also um, they are conundrums. Um, you know, if you look at a sphenophyllum, uh, for example, or medullosa, um, they have individual xylem cells that are, you know, two centimeters or three centimeters long. Uh, and we just don't have that today in, in modern ecosystems. Um, and one of the reasons I think we don't have that capacity today is um, that is a recipe for spreading embolism from one cell to another. You have stronger overlap and air bubble fills more volume, whereas angiosperm vessels have various ways to contain it. So I think one of the things that we do see is, um, is that there is, there's functional diversity within, the, within these groups. And I think a lot of the work that people have done to delimit various taxa from one another based on aspects of uh, morphology and internal anatomy, I think these are functionally meaningful you know, it's the same way that if we gathered, you know, all of, uh, you know, the members of, um, you know, all the members of a large angiosperm family today, we'd see tons and tons of, of physiological diversity, morphological diversity. And I think it's uh, the same, in, or not the same, but uh, analogous in the Paleozoic, but we have sort of a bit more stereotyped external morphology. There's some differences that I think are um, quite interesting uh, internally. Like not all arborescent uh, lycopsids are similar with their vascular anatomy, and uh, it's 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 worth uh, it's worth exploring. Thank you, John. Herman, you want to comment on Sigmaria? Yeah, uh, Sigillaria. Uh, at least one group of the Sigillarians had a different rooting system. They had not just the normal rooting system, but they had a second story deeper down, so they could extend their roots further down than the other lycopsids and therefore get to water levels that were deeper down in the ground. It's very interesting that goes along with, uh, I didn't know, John, that you discovered those things. That's really fascinating. And um, one of the things that, that Phillips and I just speculated on years ago was that when you find Sigillaria megaspores, they're often in tetrads and they have a pad, what's called an archosporeal pad that covers their opening which suggests they never opened, which would suggest that there might be, there might be uh, non-sexual reproduction in some of those sig sigil areas. Um, that's just, that was arm waving at the time, but that would be interesting to go back and look at sigillaria and megasporangia 
uh, structures to see what they did. I mean, you might be looking at a whole different way of being as a lycopsid tree. Very cool.